Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show, David Lesprans, who's an, a specialist in international law. In fact, the Wall Street Journal referred to him as probably the top lawyer in the business of advising wealthy U.S. citizens on how to expatriate to lower tax countries. David, a real pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Doug. So before we go into the details of expatriation, just give me a summary of what are the tax obligations that U.S. citizens have when they live outside the U.S. The United States is unique in having citizenship-based taxation. So an American living abroad, for example, in Israel, has the exact same tax obligations that they would have if they lived in Brooklyn. What they may have is an opportunity to offset with foreign earned income or foreign tax credits that the person in Brooklyn would not have. Okay, so if a person decides to move to Israel, he's still going to have to file his tax return. He's going to have to pay tax to the United States. He may get a credit for the tax that he paid in the U.S. Are there any other special tax forms he should be aware of? Uh, yes, he will actually get tax credit for the tax that he pays in, in Israel on his U.S. So the in that particular case, both Israel and the United States would be interested in tax from him. You look to the tax treaty, see who gets the check and who gets the foreign tax credit, and he would uh, file appropriately. He may be filing simply a 1040 NR for non-resident, or depending on how complex his life is, he may be filing other forms. He would certainly um, have bank accounts outside of the United States, so he would be filing what are called FBARs, or foreign bank account reports. And if he neglects to file a FBAR, when I talk about this topic on the show, I always tell people it's terrible, terrible if you don't do it, but maybe you can scare people a little bit more to let them know really what does happen if you don't properly file an FBAR, and you should. Well, the, the problem with, with an FBAR is that it sneaks up on you. It is only $10,000 per year, and most people don't realize that that's the amount total flowing in and out. So even that account that you have for your child who's off at university, who you pay tuition, monthly expenses, if you if that comes up to over $10,000 in a year, you need to file that. If you don't, you are subject to massive penalties and interest, and they look at the high watermark of that. Uh, and you could quite easily find that you will pay much more in tax and penalties than you would that the account would have uh, for the account's total itself. So let me clarify. When you said the cash that flows through the account, if you put $2,000 a month into the account and while your kid is studying at Hebrew University and he spends that money, so at the end of the month there's zero, but you're saying that over the course of 12 months, if you have altogether put in $24,000, that becomes reportable, uh, reportable on your FBAR? Correct. Wow. Wow, interesting. And the penalties are very high. And also just to clarify, when a U.S. person leaves the United States and he goes and opens a brokerage account and the broker says, well, are you going to sign a W-8 saying that you're not a U.S. person or a W-9, what would the, the U.S. citizen who now lives overseas have to sign? Well, unless the, if they are still a U.S. citizen, they're going to have to sign, sign the W-8. Sorry, let's say they, they retain their U.S. citizenship. They, they make Aliyah, right? They, they just moved to Israel, yes. but now they're dual citizens. What Correct. would they sign then? They, they would sign the, the, the form that's a, that would indicate that they are still a, a U.S. citizen and would pay. The brokerage firm in Israel would report, withhold, and remit um, on the uh, income that was generated by that account. Okay, so now let's go a little bit further into this guy's case. Someone's listening to the show. He says, wow, David Lesprance tells me that I'm going to have to keep paying taxes if I remain a U.S. citizen, but I'm pretty much done with the U.S. I've moved to Israel. I've been here 10, 15, 20 years, not interested in having these obligations anymore. What if I just mail in my passport and say goodbye and good riddance? What happens then? Well, the decision to expatriate, well, that is a major part of my, my law practice, it is not really the first thing that people should focus on. Uh, one thing that there are a number of people who have been out of compliance who either didn't realize that they had to file these U.S. forms or didn't even realize that they were Americans, uh, expatriation is not going to help them. It doesn't clean up past sins. It only helps you to move forward. So the first thing is that you need to be make things right with the U.S. government and bring all your taxes up to date for the last five years 
with the with the U.S. government. You then make a decision. You say, moving forward, I'm either going to remain a U.S. citizen with the benefits that, and there are a significant number of benefits to being an American, um, and I will do all the compliance, the FBARs, the dual filings, uh, et cetera, that I need to in order to stay IRS compliant. If you decide that the benefits don't outweigh the, the costs and hassles, which an increasing number of people are doing, then you have to take steps to formally renounce your U.S. citizenship. It is not a process of mailing in your passport. You have to make it an appointment with a, a U.S. embassy or consulate outside of the United States. You have to go through a formal renunciation process. And in due course, the U.S. government will issue you a document called a Certificate of Loss of Nationality, which is the U.S. government's confirmation that you are no, no longer a U.S. citizen. We are talking with David Lesperance, who specializes in helping mostly, I guess, high net worth people, but people who want to possibly give up their citizenship or not give up their citizenship, but just set up a situation where they have a, let's say, a more beneficial tax structure in order to make sure that they're not continuing to pay tax on all of the money that, they, that they're that they earning. And of course, he does that for people in a legal way. And a lot of people, unfortunately, do it in an illegal way. David, you mentioned something a minute ago, and I just want to touch on it. You said there are certain benefits to being an American citizen. Now, not I, I love America, and I grew up there, and I have many great things to say. But for someone who's living out, who's main residence now is no longer in the U.S. and only sees it as a destination for occasional vacations, visiting some family, and perhaps shopping. Uh, other than that, is there a real benefit to that person to maintain his citizenship? Again, individuals decide that for themselves, but you are finding that an increasing number of these dual citizens, particular ones that were born and, and, and raised or lived for a long time outside of the United States, are deciding that the benefits don't owe uh, don't outweigh the the, um, the hassles of maintaining the U.S. citizenship. And that's why you are seeing increasing numbers, uh, exponentially increasing numbers of Americans giving up citizenship. I guess now, the one, it, sorry, I, want, I think the one of the fears that people have would be that if they give up their U.S. citizen, I'll actually ask you two questions. One is that they won't be able to go back and visit their family. And two, if they are receiving Social Security or they're going to receive a Social Security pension one day, that that may be turned off if they give up their citizenship. How does that work? Well, once you give up your U.S. citizenship, you are then a foreigner. If we're going to continue with the example of an Israeli, Israel is not on the U.S. visa waiver list, so that person would need to get a U.S. visa. They would then uh, uh, come to the United States. And in the 25 years I've been doing expatriation, I've never had a client who's had a problem either getting a visa, if their passport they carry required one, or when they got the visa or if they didn't need the visa, getting entry at the port of entry. It's almost like Homeland Security is saying, come on in, and the IRS is saying, and we hope you stay too long, because significant presence or physical presence in the United States is another way of attracting U.S. tax status. So let me just say that back to you. I want to be very clear. The people you know, your experience has been people who give up their U.S. citizenship and mostly live outside the United States, but simply want to go back to the U.S., I guess, either for a vacation or for business, don't have a problem getting a visa? Correct. The U.S. doesn't secretly frown upon them and say, aha, commie, we'll keep them out? Uh, hasn't been my experience, and that's 25 years of, of experience. The cases that I see um, where people claim that they, they've had a problem, uh, when you look at it a bit closer, you find that they had other issues or they were just poorly advised or did a poor submission. Uh, you are going to be like any foreigner, however. you When you give up your U.S. citizenship, you have forgone the right to enter the United States. You are seeking the indulgence of the United States to allow you entry. But again, I, for example, have never had a U.S. citizenship. I've been there thousands of times, never had a problem. Again, my clients who uh, you know, present themselves uh, properly have never had a problem. So let's talk more about people who present themselves properly. Someone who's been paying his taxes all along and maybe he's acute, he's become – uh, you know, he's accumulated a few million dollars in savings and 401ks and the house he bought outside of America 
10, 15 years ago has now appreciated in value. So let's say he's worth several million dollars and he no longer wants to be in the tax net, but he's, he's on the up and up. So he's not a tax sneak. What are the tax consequences both currently to give up the citizenship as well as that he has to worry about going forward? Well, giving up your U.S. citizenship has both an immigration uh, and citizenship component, which we've been talking about, that, but it also has a tax component. At the time that you, if you want to use expatriation as a way of leaving the U.S. tax net, you also have to file a form with the, with the IRS called an IRS 8854. And the 8854 asks you two questions. The first one is looking at the last five years and the check that you sent to the United States. It's not your income. It's your U.S. tax liability. Add all that up, divide by five. And for 2014, you know, what was that amount over um, 157000 U.S. that you paid in tax? Or on the date that you walk into the U.S. Uh, embassy and renounce your citizenship, did you have more than $2 million in worldwide income? If sorry, you answer yes, income or assets? Or sorry, I said income. It's it's wealth okay. in in assets, and that includes everything, everything you own worldwide. Okay. Uh, on the eighty eight fifty four, I mean, there are some things you can do with regards to related party transfers, etc. But it's all set up on the IRS eighty eight fifty four, and if you trigger either of those two tests, you are what is called a covered expatriate, and it is at that point that there are some tax ramifications upon expatriation. There is an ability to overcome being a covered expatriate uh, if, for example, you had become an Israeli citizen at birth and you had become an American because your, your mother or your father uh, had passed that on to you. Uh, but if, in our example, the, the, the person uh, is a, a covered expatriate, then there are going to be two significant events that happen for them. First is that they are going to have a deemed disposition. You're going to have a capital gains event. They're going to have to pay tax on the capital gains that's appreciated on their assets. The second is that if they want to leave money in their estate to a U.S. person or a U.S. taxpayer, um, that is also going to be subject to tax. Now, that, that latter you can overcome with some proper planning, um, but it's the deemed disposition that most people are focusing on. Got it. So the, the, the issue is if you have accumulated some level of significant wealth, then when you expatriate, the, this, it is not just a question of no longer having a U.S. passport, but there really could be a tax consequence. David, this is actually very interesting, but we are just about out of time. We've been talking to David Lesprens, who's an expert in the international taxation and ramifications of expatriation. In the last few seconds, just tell us how can people learn more about you and follow your work? Well, they can go to uh, the website for a book that I've just co-authored called Flight of the Golden Geese. And on that website, they can also see a link to my law firm's website. Okay, and we will put a link to all of that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. David Lesprens, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, Doug. Thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. If you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.